Welcome to my YouTube channel. On Facing the Canon today, we have two inspiring and amazing women, Marilyn Baker and Tracy Williamson. Marilyn Baker, Tracy Williamson, welcome to Facing the Canon. Well, we're so glad to be here. <laughs> Delighted to have you both. Now, so that our viewers uh, know, uh, Marilyn, you're blind, yes? Yes, I certainly am, yeah. And Tracy, uh, you are deaf. Yes, that's right, yes. And yeah. how are you now communicating? Well, we're using yeah. Tracy's iPad, aren't we? I'm typing so that she gets it. Yes. Well, I'm afraid I can't do prayed. And so I'm, I'm also partially sighted. And so Marilyn is using this keyboard, which connects to the iPad by Bluetooth and typing up what, what is being said. It does mean I have to look down a bit to read it, but uh, it's um, a wonderful way. Yeah. I've also got my phone here. And it all, speaker. yes, the phone's clever, yeah. isn't it? Because it, you can hear the speech through that. It kind of transcribes it as well. Isn't it wonderful to have this type yeah. of technology? Yes, we have to be quite intentional these days about communicating. We have to sit down and we say, get the phone or get the iPad and then we can have a good talk. Absolutely. Now we have another guest with us. Would you like to introduce our other guest who's sitting with us? Yes, well, this is Goldie down here, and um, here's my hearing dog. I've had him now for nearly 10 years, and um, he's been a wonderful addition to my life, and he nudges me on the knee to alert me to all sorts of sounds, like if the doorbell goes, or, um, or if this mobile goes, if a text message, and, or if there's an alarm, or even if Marilyn wants me. And then all these different sounds, he will come and nudge me. And I say with this sign, what is it? And then he will trot off to the front door. Or he'll go and find my mobile, which is really difficult for him because it could be anywhere. It could. <laughs> and then if it's an alarm, like a fire alarm, he will lie down. And yeah. then I know it's an emergency. That is amazing. Yeah. Now, but Marilyn, you, you don't have a guide dog. Not at the moment. Did you ever have one? Oh yes, I've had about five altogether and I really love them. They make me independent. I can walk around and go into the shops and um, different things like that. But without one, life is rather difficult. So I'm really looking forward to when I can get another. Because of the pandemic, there's been a slowdown and a bit of a waiting list. But I'm really praying for a lovely, young, bouncy little thing to come along soon. Oh, now I'm going to ask you uh, uh, about your blindness and deafness. Uh, Tracy, um, t tell us, how did you uh, and when did you become deaf? Um, just before I was three, so a long time ago now, but I had a measles and then I had a high fever with the measles and it turned to um, encephalitis, which is inflammation of the brain. And so I was in hospital for several months and then um, became kind of paralysed. And, and actually, um, when I came out of hospital, they didn't realise that I couldn't hear. And in fact, it affected my eyesight as well, but they didn't realise that either. And because all the kind of um, focus was on me learning to walk again and use my arms and that. And the nature of the deafness is that I can't interpret what I hear. I do hear more than less now, but I do hear some sound. And so when I had any tests, it wasn't obvious that I couldn't hear. So. Yeah. But that was how it came about. And for the first few years at school, it wasn't known. And um, so school was quite a struggle to begin with. Uh, but then it was diagnosed that you had lost your hearing. Yes, when I was 12, eventually. And, and so it was good that I knew what was happening. It didn't actually affect the fact that the teachers didn't expect much of me, though. And um, 
because it was a sort of stream system and I was already in the low achieving streams and I just stayed there. <laughs> but uh, they knew now and I knew that I wasn't slow learning, but it had taken a long time. No, really. well, you were yeah. definitely not, but you, you ended up doing um, a degree and you studied English. Yes, I did, yes, yes. That was an amazing thing, really. I mean, looking back, I don't know how I did it. But I wanted to leave home, I wanted to get away. I wanted actually to become a teacher of the deaf. And so I was determined to get some A-levels. I didn't get all of them that I wanted, but I got enough to go to a college here, in fact, in Hertfordshire, and um, started training to be a teacher. And it didn't work out to be a teacher in the end. I, I couldn't manage it in school. But um, I did a degree in um, English Lit, and, um, and I did get quite a high grade. I think God must have been helping me, even though I didn't know him at that point. Yes. Oh, <laughs> that's wonderful, Tracy. OK, Marilyn, tell us about you. How did you lose your eyesight? Well, actually, I say it's the only time I've ever been early. I was born um, prematurely. And because of that, and I choked on, on my bottle that they were giving me, my mother was ill, you see, and so they put me in an incubator and this is what damaged the eyes. But they didn't know in those days that eyes could be damaged because of having too much oxygen. So really, it was an accident in the hospital. And um, when I came home, my parents still didn't realise that I was going to be blind. But one day they noticed I had a squint. They took me to the hospital and... Um, the terrible news came back to my parents after I'd stayed in there for a while to say that I was never going to see properly and that I would in fact lose all my sight. And I remember my parents being so devastated. Of course, I was very young indeed. I didn't remember what they said, but I think I felt it in my heart that I was a kind of disappointment to them, you know, that something was wrong, you know. And my mother remembers me sitting and losing my um, sight and losing the light sense. I would sit in the garden, apparently, and stare up into the sky. But of course, I don't remember that. And so I only remember really myself uh, being blind. Yes. But then you um, ended up going to um, a grammar school for girls. Uh, for blind here in Chorley Wood. Absolutely, uh, where, yes. Where we're recording today. Um, how old were you when you ended up going there? Well, around about 12, um, I did an entrance exam. The first time I sort of failed it and the second time I got in there. Um, I'd been at boarding school since the age of five because in those days there wasn't kind of integrated education really you had to go to special school so I went to this other school this Chorley Wood school and that was far away from my parents because um, we lived in Birmingham and so I was obviously nearer London and I really missed my parents but I did learn a lot at the school. It must have been quite uh, scary to go at the age of five Marilyn. Do, do you have memories of that time? I do I mean you know, I just remember my mother trying to tell me that I was going to love it. But when I got to the school, when I was five, this primary school, really, I missed her so much. I was an only child, you see, and I just loved being at home with her and with Dad. But, you know, basically I missed them and also it just felt so strange and so different. All the other pupils were blind too, but it's, it's a very difficult age to be taken away from your parents, I think. Yes, absolutely. Now, Tracy, you uh, growing up, um, it wasn't easy. Um, and I, I gather you, you have a sense that when you were in hospital, um, when you were around three, they actually put you in an adult ward. Why, why did they put you in an adult ward? Were there no children's wards at the time? Well, actually, I don't really know the reason. No. <laughs> but it was thought initially that I had polio. And okay. it was in the 60s. And um, when there was a polio epidemic. And, and, um, and so I was put in this ward and there were two adult polio victims in the same ward. And they were wearing iron lungs. 
and I can't remember much. I've got fruity memories of that time, but I do remember the iron lungs and they seem like monsters to me. Yes. As a two-year-old and um, I didn't understand what they were. I could just see these huge mounds above the people and their feet sticking out. And I can still remember the kind of gurgling sound, chunking sound that they made. And then there were other memories. There was a very angry nurse. And, um, and my mum doesn't remember her, but I do, and she used to come and shout. And my mum, my arms would make involuntary movements, quite sort of spastic in a way, in my movements. And I would throw out food or throw out toys, and she would get really angry. And that was traumatic because my family were only there at strict times. And, and the rest of the time it was this angry nurse and the monsters on either side. And, and other things that happened that were kind of scary yes. that I've remembered since yeah. as well. Yeah. And um, possibly an abusive incident that I've remembered since. Yes. Just in fleeting memories that I've had to ask the Lord to bring here into. Absolutely. So, so all in all, it was a difficult time. And, but I do have these frequent remember, memories of fear and trauma and struggle of that time. And so, uh, your, your father passed away and then your mother remarried uh, and your stepfather was quite abusive to you. Um, yes. Yes, and my dad had died when I was seven, and um, my mum went to this club and met this man, and at the beginning, I was really fond of him, mainly because he bought my sister and I chocolates each week. <laughs> and I was a bit naive, and I loved him because I wanted chocolate. <laughs> but I remember I sort of, um, one night I went out to bed, and um, his coat was hanging on the banister, and as I passed it, I dropped a little kiss on top of it and said, please may he be my daddy. I wasn't praying to God as such because he wasn't a Christian family, but praying to something. And he did become my, my daddy in a way, my stepfather, but, but he changed as soon as he permanently moved in and would sort of stand in the room and shout at me nonstop that I was mental, unlovable, shouldn't have been born, and he would just scream at the top of his voice, and, and abusive in other ways as well. And so I just learned to bury everything and try and um, get through it as best I could, not to show emotion, not to react. And so that was sort of really how I grew up in a way. Uh, uh, th there's a moment in your life when you were despairing and you stood on a hill uh, near a motorway and screamed out at God uh, and then threw yourself down. Uh, tell us what happened. Yes, but that was an amazing thing. And I felt very low one day. And, and as you said, I was walking the dog, actually. I had a corgi. And she was my real comfort in those times. But, but I ended up on this kind of um, hill with a bridge going over the M25. And, um, and I knew from previous experience that there was no barrier at the bottom. The hill just went straight down on the motorway. And, and so, as you said, I screamed out. It was a sudden kind of despair. And... And so I started rolling and the gradient was quite steep because it wasn't a hill that people climbed normally. <laughs> and, um, and so I was going really fast and I wasn't consciously thinking, I'm trying to die. But I was just kind of abandoning myself to the moment, really. But the incredible thing was that I came to this sudden jar and stop, as if I'd ran up against something and couldn't roll any further. And my face was pressed down in the ground. And I felt sort of scared because I couldn't imagine what it could be. And I lay there for ages. But in the end, I, I rolled over and opened my eyes. And there was no one and nothing. 
just the grass and the slope and the cars. And I knew then that something had stopped me, but I didn't know what. I kind of buried it like everything else. But there was in my heart a kind of tiny little kernel. Maybe there was someone there that I heard. Later on, Tracy, a, a Christian friend of yours uh, persuaded you to go to church. And uh, what happened when you went to church? Oh, well, this was when I was at college in my first year. <laughs> and I was um, sharing with a Christian. And yes, yeah, she went to a church in Watford. And, um, and so she persuaded me to go and we had to wear hats. It was a street kind of church, and really hats aren't me at all. And, and so I died, said no for ages, but something made me decide yes on this particular day. So I went along, and, um, and really I myself found it really boring. <laughs> but then afterwards, a really lovely thing happened. Because this, this friend, Helen, she had some friends there, an older couple, and they invited us back for tea. And it was cream cakes, which I loved. And so we sat there in this really cosy lounge and they were so friendly to me, as well as to her. And I, amazingly enough, decided to try and go myself and back to that church, really because I wanted the cream tea. <laughs> well, I God, stuck that head to do. God, God uses even <laughs> cream cakes. <laughs> yes. yes, yes. Then, how did you come to faith? How did you come to know Jesus? I know the students at college, a girl called Ruth. She invited me into her room for a coffee and and so halfway through the conversation, she said, Trace, this isn't just to be friendly. It's because I'm a Christian. And I've been praying and God brought you to my mind and gave me an urgency that I needed to invite you in and tell him, tell you that he loves you as a father. And she said, do you know what I'm talking about? And really I had no idea, but it opened up a conversation and... And she shared and how she'd found the love of God and what Jesus had done for me in dying on the cross. And she said, God wants you to know his love now in this life. And I looked at her face and it was that that convinced me really because it was like she was glowing as if she was talking about someone that she loved with all her heart, like a boyfriend even. And yet it wasn't a boyfriend, it was God. And I couldn't believe that someone could kind of glow like that for God. And, and all she said, I thought, can there really be love for someone like me? And, and it was a few weeks after that that I eventually prayed and reading a little booklet called Journey into Life and to explain how to become a Christian. And, and I sort of prayed and just said, I don't understand everything. But I want you like that girl, I want to know you and your love. And that was when it, when it all began, really. Yeah. Um, your, your encounter with Jesus, that was the beginning. Yes, yes, that's right. And in that moment of praying, I couldn't kind of, um, I didn't feel sudden wondrous emotions. Everything had been buried for too long. But suddenly deeper than that, not being able to feel, there was a knowing in my heart, and I knew he'd heard that kind of faltering prayer I'd prayed, and that he was there with me. It was an amazing knowing, because I'd never known it before. But I knew it now, and I woke up the next day, and the knowing was still there. And, and so, I mean, that's... Well, can't remember exactly, but 35 years now. Ago, yes. And he's never let me down since. I've let him down many times, but he hasn't me. Let you down. And so. Wonderful, Tracy. What about you, Marilyn? Tell us about your story. Uh, so you're at school in Chorleywood, 
Um, yes, it was there that I came to know the Lord, really. Yeah. Now, were you, were you taken to a Billy Graham crusade? Yeah, um, we, we were allowed to go. He was uh, doing his Mission England thing. And um, we went for a talk. We couldn't stay there to have any counselling or, or talk to anybody. We just went for the talk. Um, it wasn't him, actually. It was one of his uh, associates that did this talk. And... Um, do you remember which one? I don't remember who it was, actually. No, but it was one of the associates. It was, yes. And I remember at the time I'd been asking loads of questions. You see, I'd found a book in the school chapel and it was in Braille and it was called The Transforming Friendship. And this book really did something in my heart. Dr. Leslie Weatherhead wrote this and it was all about how you could meet this Jesus and I thought Jesus was dead I thought he was just a man in history yes. and then a girl in my class she started this club up and said it was all about you know young people's fellowship and I went to that and I thought she said we've got to tell everyone about Jesus so oh this is a bit embarrassing I don't really know him but after this service I had such a sense that all the things in my heart the questions I had they were beginning to be answered but there was one stumbling block I couldn't really believe that Jesus was more than a man he seemed like a very good man but not really God and I remember asking God this specifically and two days later this parcel came in the post it was from america and it was a book in braille and it had no sender's name and when i looked at the title it said it was called the overwhelming proof of the divinity of jesus now a braille bible would take about two meters of bookshelf and i wouldn't have had a clue where to look for any of these references about jesus being the messiah or anything like that or about God but they were all listed there and I read them and my heart just began to understand in a new way and so after that Billy Graham uh, associate preached I said right I want to be saved and, and and I didn't know what to do exactly I went back to my room and I said Lord will you will you come right now and, and forgive me for things I, I just want you to come right in now and I want you to save me I remember telling one of the girls, I'm saved. She said, what are you talking about? I said, I don't know. I just know I am. She said, I don't know how you can know that. But I did. It was a word, saved. I didn't really know what that meant exactly, saved from sin, I suppose. But the next day I woke up and I knew that I was never going to be truly ever alone again, that he was there right by me. It was like a light inside had switched on. So you knew from day one that something had changed. I did then, yes. It was like a sort of companionship, a sort of friendship. I just knew he was there. I started to talk to him about my life. My father had been rather dismissive of my life in a way. He didn't think that I would really be able to achieve much. I think he felt being blind, I'd probably have to be looked after all my life. And um, bit by bit, as I began to talk to the Lord, I felt somehow that he had a plan for me. I think somebody showed me those verses in Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. And I thought, Lord, you have got plans for my life. You have. And one day when dad had been particularly sort of dismissive, I remember going to my bedroom at home and saying, Lord, I'm fed up of this barrier, this blindness that dad doesn't seem to think I'll be able to manage anything much. And in my heart, it was like thoughts came in, not an audible voice, but thoughts. And God said, but I've got plans for you and you and I, we can live life together. It's you and me together in life. And I remember saying right then, right, Lord, I'm taking on your plans. I'm going to do what you want. I'm not going to listen to anyone else. If you've got exciting plans for me, here I am. How, how old were you when that happened? <clears throat> I think I might have been about 17 or 18. And, it, and you've been walking with the shepherd, the Lord Jesus, since then? Yes, I have. I mean, obviously, like other people, I've had ups and downs and things. I went to the Royal College of Music when I was 19, and I studied the oboe there and um, piano and things like that. And that's when my faith was really put to the test because 
somehow when I got to college I mean I was living suddenly in what we might call a sighted world I'd been with blind people most of my life and suddenly I mean I had to learn my way from um, a hostel where I lived to the college I had to learn busy route in London with a white stick walking along in London I'd never done anything like that before and one day when I was there at the college the first day it was a student had arranged to meet me and take me back to the hostel just to be sure that I could manage it and she didn't turn up and I remember sitting in the canteen feeling desolate and I prayed as never before and I said God I said if you're real if you're really there to help me what am I going to do now I don't know anybody I don't know how I'm going to get back to my hostel and just then this man came up sat next to me said I'm Martin I'm from the Christian Union and I said, oh, are you? And he said, yes. And we got chatting and I told him my predicament. He said, don't worry, I'll walk with you. You go ahead of me and I'll follow you and check that you're doing it okay. And those people in that Christian group utterly befriended me and kind of took me under their wing. And the days at college for me were incredible. That's where my faith began to grow. And, and, really and it really way. blossomed. And uh, but were you the only um, blind person at that particular school? Well, yes. I mean, at the Royal College of Music, I was at the time. And um, I mean, students were helpful. I remember because technology wasn't advanced as it is now. I had to dictate all my compositions and music to people and students who were willing had to write it all out for me. I had friends who would try and put music notation into braille for me. It was quite a business. And I loved playing the oboe. One thing I never did do, which might surprise some people who know that I sing now, is that I never studied any voice production or vocals. I was a, a pianist of a type and I was an oboist. And I always thought if God was going to use my music, it would be like as an oboist, if you like. Never, ever thought that I would ever be used to be a singer. You both are two very remarkable women. You really are. And um, thank you so much for joining us on Facing the Canon. What an incredible story. Marilyn Baker, Tracy Williamson, books, CDs of music and worship. Thank God that was only part one. We're having them back for part two because we want to hear how the Lord led them on, how the Lord led them to write and speak and teach and preach and worship and sing. I hope that's inspired you. Please join us again for part two with Marilyn and Tracy. <laughs>